uh, college, and I got bad answers when I was in college, and and so I discovered apologetics. Apologetics just, just means to give a defense, and the seminary that I ended up going to had a home study apologetics course. Uh, over the over the course of about two months, I, I studied it, and I remember I came out of my study one day, and I told my wife, I said, this is true, and she's like, yeah, I know. And I was like, no, no, this is true, and she's like, yeah, I know, and I was like, no, this is like really true, and she's like, yeah, I get it, uh, and so I just had, you know, as a relativist, most lawyers, most lawyers are relativists, right? Tell us what you want us to argue and give us some money and we'll argue it. And uh, so I, but I was, I was convinced that the, that the things that we just sung about, the things that we preach were true for all people at all times and places. And I thought, man, I'd love to work with college students and try to help them get answers to their questions. Cause I know when I was in college, I didn't get good answers to those questions. And so the ministry that we're a part of, it's called Ratio Christi. It's Latin for the reason of Christ. And it was birthed out of that seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina. So long story short, I ended up leaving the practice of law, was uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina for seven years, leading a chapter there. But the president of our ministry, he grew up in Utah. He grew up a Mormon, and he had a heart for Utah. He got saved and had obviously had a heart for Utah. And so I had gone out to Utah with him in 2017, just trying to stir some you know, activity up and maybe start a chapter there. And my heart was broken for uh, the people in Utah. Um, it is a barren place. Most people think... Utah is uh, a Christian state. In fact, because it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or broadly speaking, Mormonism. But in fact, Pew Research thinks that you know that Utah is 73% Christian. But the reality is, and I'll show you today a little bit about what the LDS actually believe. Utah is the least evangelical state in the country. So it's about 2% evangelical, and statistically, that's an unreached people group if you look at the, the mission societies, you know, the 1040 window. In fact, the county that I live in now, the county that my, my family lives in, Utah County, which is the home of Brigham Young University, is about 0.3 or 0.4% uh, evangelical Christian. So statistically, there are more Christians in Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia than there are in Utah County, Utah. And so we just felt the burden that uh, we couldn't go back home. We were originally going to be in Utah for a year. And since then, we've sort of burned the boats and the bridges, and we're there for the rest of our lives. And I'll tell you a little bit about the ministry that we're hoping to um, to have there and then what that looks like uh, you know, for us. So again, Rosho Christi, Latin for the reason of Christ. We're on about 150 college campuses across, across the country. We have a chapter at the University of Washington. So if you're interested and you've got, you've got questions, our whole thing is ask good questions and seek good answers. We, found, we think those answers are found, are found in the biblical Jesus. And so this is a, 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 the upper left corner. That's the university that I'm at now, Utah Valley University which is in Utah County. About We're about five miles from Brigham Young University. UVU, Utah Valley University, about 45,000 students, maybe 200 Christians, maybe probably close to 150 Christians in that school. Um, so it is a barren place. It's an unreached people group. And this is one of our meetings that we have. And uh, so, there, you know, some, we have vision. One of the things that we've been able to do uh, when we're out there, and this is with, um, in, in conjunction with David, is we started doing these mission trips. We would bring people from other places to Utah. Utah is the easiest place in the country to get into conversations with people uh, who are not Christians about Jesus, because they would say that they are Christians, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But it's a very easy place to get into conversations. Um, and so we bring students there to both learn how to do evangelism to, to know and, and to know what they believe and why they believe it. But we'll talk about at the very end here today. I'm convinced that most evangelicals are more Mormon in the way they think about God, religion, and certainly the gospel than we realize. And so part of the purpose of these trips is we want to help people, maybe for the first time, who've grown up in the church, be exposed to the true gospel. And just this summer, um, with, uh, with David now living in Israel, we got a chance to lead a group of about 15 students to Israel for the first time, and we're hoping to do those in the future. And our goal is this time next year, we would, this, this uh, town here, Vineyard, uh, 10 years ago, there was about 150 people there. It's, it's in Utah County, and now there's about 15,000 people there. So New York Times uh, in the last decade said it was the fastest growing city in the country, and there's not a single Christian church in Vineyard. And so we're hoping this time next year, uh, we're meeting now as a core team, but we would have a church plant 
that would be meeting there, sharing the true gospel, right? What we just, what we just sang about, uh, the, the one true gospel. And so we would say, and so I just want to just briefly today, I just wanted to share a little bit about, many of you have probably never heard about what, what Mormons believe, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You, you've maybe had a Mormon missionary come knock at your door, but just wanted to share briefly about what, you know, what, why we would say that they are not Christian, and then, and then maybe at the end just give you a little loving challenge to, to think about the true gospel, even what we what we just sang about. We would say in the area, when we talk about evangelism to the LDS, uh, the areas that we focus on are the nature of God, the nature of Jesus, the scriptures, the gospel, and truth. And in all of those things, our Mormon friends believe something different. So a different view of God, a different view of Jesus, a different gospel, a different view of the scriptures, uh, even really a different view of truth. For them, truth is very subjective. It's based on a, a subjective personal experience. And so um, I want to just, again, share briefly, because many people don't realize the differences between Mormonism and the true gospel, and maybe some of you have never realized that. So I want to just go over a couple key, key distinctives, and then, again, kind of challenge you at the end, the church, and this is, you know, we'll give you a, a, a super quick overview, but the church was uh, started, so to speak, by Joseph Smith, right? He, he evidently was praying, this is in upstate New York, praying about which denomination, which church he should join, and uh, supposedly he goes into the sacred grove, um, a misapplication of James 1.5, and he prays that, that God would reveal to him the truth, and supposedly heaven, Heavenly Father and Jesus, two distinct beings, appeared to him and told him, don't join any denomination denomination, but we're, we're going to, we need to restore the church. There needs to be a restoration for the one true church, and that is supposedly Mormonism broadly understood. After Joseph Smith died, there was an immediate church split, and now since then there's been, there's probably close to 200 different factions under the broad umbrella of Mormonism. The leading, the main church that you probably heard of is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's sort of their, the mainline denomination. But in the county that I live in, uh, about 15 miles south of where we live, there's a polygamous community called Rocky Ridge, and David and I actually led a group. To, we, we went door-knocking evangelism in, in that county, and, and they actually believe, according to what Joseph Smith and Brigham Young taught, that you have to have multiple wives to get into the highest level of celestial glory. In fact, Brigham Young taught that you had to have three wives in order to make it to the highest level of celestial glory kingdom. So the Mormons believed there had to be a restored church, that, that the, the true doctrines of the church had been lost, so there had to be a restoration, right? There had to be a restoration of priesthood, apostles, and the true gospel. They believe they have four sacred texts, the Book of Mormon being the primary one, doctrines and covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and then the Bible. So they will, they will claim that the Bible is part of their sacred texts, but as you, if you have any interaction with them, the Bible gets the le is is the one that they um, believe in the least in in some sense. But they believe in living and continuing prophets. So for them, the current prophet, his name is Russell Nelson. He's ninety, I think ninety eight, ninety nine years old. And when what he what he says is the word of God. Actually, they believe that Jesus communes with the prophet. And so when he speaks today, he's a living apostle, and his words have more weight even than Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and all the prophets of the past. And so they all believe in continuing revelation to themselves as opposed to standing on the written word of God, even what we prayed about earlier today. They believe the eighth article of faith for the LDS is that they believe in the Bible as far as it's been translated correctly with the implication that it hasn't been translated correctly. We talked about this yesterday in our apologetics evangelism sermon. They believe the Bible, like the telephone game, has been mistranslated and really trans mistransmitted uh, over the years. And so they can't actually trust what the Bible says. And so there was this, they believe there was this great apostasy that happened sometime after the apostles died, and all of the teachings of the original true church were lost, and that's why there had to be a restoration that was brought about by Joseph Smith, who brought about this restoration to the original teachings of the church. Now, I want to, let me just take you, if you open your Bibles, I want, to, I, want to, I want you to read in Galatians. Whenever we're, whenever we're talking to our LDS friends, the book of Galatians is a great book to go through. Uh, we just actually sung about this. It was obviously God's sovereignty even that we would sing this song. But I, I just think this is such an important verse for us to think about and for you to think about. In Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 
uh, 6, it says, Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. For that, that for, for there is no, uh, that for that is, there is no another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, as we have said before. So now I say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one received, let him be accursed. There is only one gospel by which we are being saved. And the LDS church preaches a different God, a different Jesus, and a different gospel, a, a, a Jesus that cannot save. And it's heartbreaking. And that's why we have to be able to have the courage to share the true gospel with people that are perishing. So they believe that God was once a mortal man. Think of, that God was a man who continually progressed and he became an exalted man or with it, he became God. So on his planet, he was a man and he was good enough. And in the end, he was rewarded in exaltation with this planet. He pla- passed through the school of life and his reward was this planet with these beings. And we'll show in a second, that's also can be true for you. If you're a guy, if you're a lady, sorry but you can't be a God. But, but if you're, that could be true for you where you could actually become a God, right? So this is, sorry, same slide twice, just to see if you're paying attention. Uh, the father has a tangible body of flesh and bones, right? So he's a mortal guy just like us, and, and we could talk about how they get that, but, he, but he's, a, he's a man who became God. They do not believe in the Trinity. We were talking in the, uh, in the foyer early. It's the triune God of the Bible that saves, right? It's the, it's the belief in Jesus, the second person of the Trinity that I put my faith and my hope in. They believe in three separate beings, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, who are united in purpose, and they call that the Trinity. Again, a different God. They're actually innumerable gods. In Hinduism, they believe in thousands of gods. If you actually do the math, uh, LDS believe in millions of gods because all these men supposedly through years have become gods. You are, according to the Mormons, gods in embryo. You can become heavenly fathers. And so there's a famous couplet, Lorenzo Snow, one of the prophets, he said, as man is now, God once was. And as God is now, man may become. If you think about everything that the LDS church teaches, and we say this lovingly, it's all the lies from Satan from Genesis 3. Every human being, according to LDS theology, has the potential to become an exalted man, to exalted to godhood. Uh, according to gospel principles, we can become gods like our heavenly father. And that's what we were created for. And when I talked to, we were talking to a student one time, and he, he, an LDS student, and he told my friend, one day you will bow down to me as a God. He told him that when we were doing evangelism. And, and, and so they believe in, they believe that in the pre-mortal existence that you had to fight and you had to do all this stuff. And if you were valiant in the pre-mortal existence, that's why you have a body here. That's one of the reasons why LDS families have such big families is because they need to provide more bodies for souls that were in the pre-mortal were more valiant and they can have these big families. And then if you continue on after death and you continue to fight and work, then you too, again, if you're a guy, can receive, receive exaltation or godhood. In the LDS view, who is Jesus? Jesus is your elder brother. Jesus was a created being just like you are. Lucifer also was a created being. So Jesus is, Luther, is, is Lucifer's spirit brother, just like he is your brother. If, if Jesus was a created being, he cannot be your savior. And all other, other human beings, all of us are spirit sons and daughters of Heavenly Father in a real, literal sense. In fact, they used to teach, Brigham Young used to teach, that Heavenly Father came down and actually had intercourse with Mary, and that's how Jesus was born. They believe essentially, this is, this, you know, is recorded coming to the end of, of just thinking about this. They believe in a general salvation for everybody. So one of the hardest things in talking to LDS is we, use, we say we're using the same lexicon, but a very different dictionary. So in every single word that we use, they use the same word and they mean something completely different. So when you're talking to LDS, that conversation is so frustrating because you know what you mean and they're using the same, you're using the same word and you mean completely different things. 
So when you say, they say salvation is by grace, they'll say, you'll, they'll say, yeah, amen. Because for them, salvation is a general salvation for everybody. Essentially, Jesus made it possible so that every one of us could, could make it to one of their three levels of heaven, except for outer darkness, which they don't even talk about anymore. Uh, they used to say that that was reserved for LDS who had left the faith. So they used to teach that the only way you could go to outer darkness is if you apostatize from their religion. You know, it's heartbreaking. But individual exaltation, this is the thing, individual exaltation is merited by obedience to the laws of the gospel. They hate salvation by grace through faith alone. James Talmadge, in his study of the Articles of Faith, refers to justification by belief alone or faith alone as a most pernicious doctrine. Think about that. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is the most pernicious doctrine. And they believe you actually have to become perfect. And if you're perfect, then you can get the highest level of glory, which is the celestial kingdom. If you're just okay, which would be, you know, for most of you, you get the terrestrial kingdom and the worst of the worst get the telestial kingdom. That is not the gospel that we hold to. That is not what the Bible says. Teaches. And so this is a chart that we use to help people think this is this is actually from their own work. This is from the gospel principles. This is, they believe, this is all the things that you have to do in order to receive celestial kingdom. Now think about if you're if you're a, a, an LDS, faithful LDS, and you've never heard the true gospel of Jesus, and you have the weight of this laying on your shoulder, you have to do all of those things, and you have to be perfect. And it says, it says grace that only after all that you can do, that's from 2 Nephi, and you feel the weight of that. That's why in Utah County, statistically, the most, when you, when you, when you break it down by the number of people, statistically, Utah County, highest rate of depression, highest suicide, highest uh, addiction to depression medicine, highest bankruptcies, highest foreclosures, all that. Why? Because the weight of the reality of the impossibility of this gospel weighs on them. And then we get a chance to come in and share the true gospel with them. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the true, the biblical Jesus, and you will be saved. And we can share the true gospel with them. Right? I mean, this is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, so important. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. It's so interesting. Joseph Smith actually did his own translation, the Joseph Smith translation. Now, he didn't actually translate anything. He just, you know, he just kind of made it up. But he translated Romans 4, 5. Think about this. Romans 4, 5, such a beautiful passage for us who have, who have trusted in Jesus. And the, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who just Justifieth the ungodly. Praise be to God, he justifies the ungodly. Otherwise, none of us would make it. His faith is counted as righteousness. And Joseph Smith changed the entire meaning of the text in his Joseph Smith translation. He changed it to he justifieth not the ungodly. That is no gospel at all. So how does this apply to us? And this is, what, what have we discovered when we bring mission teams to Utah is that most I would argue many evangelicals are more Mormon in the way they think about God and the way they think about the gospel. We we think that God loves us as long as we're reading our Bible and doing the right things, but as soon as we stop doing things, then God starts hating us and he's mad at us, and I just got to get better and I got to do more, and if I can just do enough, then God will love me. But that is not the gospel. That is not salvation. Well, we could say we get salvation by grace through faith alone as a way to enter the kingdom, but or enter God's family. But now somehow we think now as members of God's family, we have to produce and do and all this stuff, right? So that God will just love us. And when we don't do enough, we beat ourselves up. But in Christianity and biblical Christianity, the verdict comes before the performance, not after. In every other man-made religion, the verdict comes after the performance. And guess what? Your performance will never be good enough. It's heartbreaking to talk to LDS who sometimes with tears in their eyes will say, I'm just not good enough. I'm just not doing good enough. And we would say, come to the biblical Jesus. So let me just ask you this right now, if you're a believer, right now, do you think the Father sees you as righteous as Jesus? If you, if you put your faith in the, and trust in the, in the one true Jesus, the biblical Jesus, do you think right now that the Father sees you as righteous as Jesus? And we, we ask you know, our, our Christian friends and, the, and students who come on these trips all the time, they'll say, no, of course not. And then we'll say, well, what would make him see that? If I could just be better, if I could just do more. 
Do you see, do you see, Christian, how that is not the true gospel? 2 Corinthians 5.21 is such an important verse for us in Utah. We share this in in, in Philippians 3. But it's for our sake that he made him, the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Or Philippians 3.9, and be found in him, be found in Jesus, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. See, in biblical Christianity, we are declared innocent. We are declared innocent. Why? Because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. So we are, we're in a courtroom and, and the judge nails the gavel down and he says, you are innocent. And then we say hallelujah, and then we spend the rest of our lives in the courtroom trying to be better and do better and try harder. Stop hanging out in the courtroom. Your identity is secure in Jesus. Now run. What does Paul say in in, uh, Galatians 5? It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Don't go back to the yoke of slavery. Live in that freedom. Now, it's not freedom to just do whatever you want to do. It's freedom to be who you were created to be. And when you blow it, when we blow it, we run back to the finished work of Christ on the cross. And then we run further towards him. And our LDS friends do not know this. They do not get salvation by grace through faith alone because they're taught a false gospel. And so what we get to do by God's grace is to preach the true gospel to people who've never heard it. Many of these missionaries have gone all over the world to preach a false gospel, and yet they've never heard the true gospel. And so it is hard, I'm not going to lie to you, it's a hard place to do ministry, um, but we are we are praying that we would, uh, we're raising up support, so we're full-time missionaries, to be able to have the church, to be able to, there's some other things we want to do, a Christian study center, a place to have these conversations and to work on the college campus. Uh, our, mini- our information is back there. If you want information about our ministry and what we're doing and, and maybe how you could even partner with us uh, financially or prayerfully, we'd love to talk to you. I'll, I'll be, you know, I'll hang out here uh, afterwards and love to talk to you more about the work uh, that God is doing in Utah, because there is uh, a movement of uh, uh, the Spirit that's happening there, and uh, we need laborers, but we need prayer uh, for all the things that are happening in Utah. So uh, I want to pass it off to my friend David, who's going to talk to you about um, the work that's happening in Israel, and you get a chance to hear from him.